Welcome to Sunday School on the Go from the First Baptist Church in Tallahassee on this last Sunday in August. As many of us return to our Sunday School classes while others remain careful and cautious. In this new chapter in the life of our church, I'm sure our staff and our pastor search committee are grateful for your prayers as they earnestly seek God's leadership in the days ahead. I'm Jim Glass, one of the teachers in Al Harris's Pairs and Spares class, and I have the privilege of guiding you through our study this quarter of some of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Throughout this quarter, we've paid a long and lingering visit to the Library of Wisdom that we compared to America's own Library of Congress, with aisles and aisles of insight, information, and understanding. Last week, we left the book of Proverbs to visit a small, often neglected annex to the library that we were introduced to as the Song of Solomon. We learned that although the book has been interpreted in a number of different ways, the primary theme of the book is found in chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 5, and chapter 8, verse 4, each of which says, Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Marital love is to be reserved for and preserved in the holy and righteous context of two lives becoming one flesh according to God's design and purpose. Last week, we saw how marital love is to be reserved for the plan that God has, and today we'll see how marital love is preserved as God desires in chapter 5, verses 6 through 16 of the Song of Solomon. Although the Old Testament had been organized into sections and subsections long ago, it was a system designed by Stephen Langton, who served as the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1207 to 1228, that became the pattern that we have today. While most of the chapter divisions in our Bible are easy to understand, some like the opening verse of chapter 5 don't seem to be in the right place. With the first verse of chapter 5, the brief story of the wedding and the couple's first night celebration comes to an end, and an entirely new day and chapter in their lives begins in the second verse. Now, some time has passed since the wedding. We don't know the circumstances that led to their separation, but the recently married bride and groom appear to be apart once more. Here, the bride is speaking once again. And as she had done in chapter 3 and the first four verses, she tells about a dream she had. And she as she relates beginning in the first verse, where she says, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. She replies, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? My beloved thrust his hand to the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. Now, she's asleep, but her heart is awake. Most, if not all of us, have experienced dreams so realistic that it was as if we were wide awake even though we were still sleeping. So it was with the Shulamite bride. With her husband gone, she longs for them to be together, and even her dreams play out her aching desire to be with him again. In this second dream that we read about in the Song of Solomon, her beloved has once again departed, and she because of her great love for him, misses him deeply. And so she dreams about looking for him. In her dream, she hears her husband knocking at her bedroom door and calling her to open it for him. He's just returned from tending his flock in the night, and his hair is wet with the dew. The bride, perhaps playfully, replies that she's already gotten ready for bed and doesn't want to get her feet dirty again by going to the door. In her dream, she might have imagined herself back in the home of her upbringing where she didn't wear shoes. Excited to see him again, she helps him open the door as he goes to open it, but in her dream, he's not there. So she runs out into the streets of the night to look for him as we read beginning in verse 6. 
I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my cloak, those watchmen of the walls. As in her previous dream, the watchmen find her, but mistaking her for a commoner and not the wife of the king, they beat her and took her cloak, the light outer garment she had worn over her night clothes, perhaps leaving it behind as Joseph did in his account encounter with Potiphar's wife. As she dreams, it's possible that she imagines she has not expressed her love as completely as she had wished, or as she thought her husband might have desired her to. On the other hand, there may have been something that caused them to be separated for a time. Either way, we don't know for sure. Only that she was distressed by their emotional or physical separation. In her dream, he was gone. And if he had left without something that reaffirmed her constant, passionate, and abiding love for him, it's possible he could begin to question her love. However, there's no indication that there was anything wrong in their relationship, as some of us had suggested. What we do know is that in verse 8, the bride, who is now awake, tells her dream to the daughters of Jerusalem, asking them to let her husband know just how much she really and truly loves him. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am sick with love. In response, the daughters of Jerusalem ask in verse 9, how was your beloved better than others, most beautiful of women? How was your beloved better than others that you so charge us? Even though they had witnessed the growth of the relationship from early on and even joined in the marriage celebration itself, they still seemed to be surprised at the depth of her desire, the intensity of her passion, and the tenacity of her longing for her husband. So they want to know what it is that makes him so desirable that she seeks after him even in her dreams. They want to hear from her own lips the description of the one they also love, although they had not been chosen to be the one so beloved of the king. We find her lengthy answer in verses 10 through 16. In her response, we find that he is the best of all men in every way. She takes images from everything that's glorious in the kingdom of nature and all that is celebrated in the realm of the arts to present a picture of his external appearance. Whatever is precious, lovely, and admired is all combined in the living beauty of this one person whom she loves so very much. Here's what she says, beginning in verse 10. My beloved is dazzling and ruddy outstanding among 10,000. His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. His cheeks are like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness, and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved, and this is is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. First, she celebrates the colors that come to her mind when she thinks of her husband. She says he is radiant and ruddy. Now, I can't explain why the Holman Christian Standard Bible that is used by the writers of our quarterly translate this as fit and strong. Other translations read, he is white. The idea comes from a word that means to shine or to glow. When used to refer to the color of the skin, it meant a dazzling light complexion. He is also ruddy, 
The word is translated either as red or ruddy in our Old Testament when used to describe someone or something. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we read about Samuel's search for a successor to King Saul. Because Saul had failed to follow God's instructions concerning the defeat of the Amalekites, God had rejected him as king. And Samuel was sent to find his replacement. You probably know the story well. God sent Samuel to the city of Bethlehem where a man named Jesse lived with instructions to take an offering and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. Jesse had eight sons, and when Samuel saw Eliab, the oldest, he said, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But God said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So, one by one, each of the next six sons appeared before Samuel, only to be rejected by the Lord. So Samuel asked Jesse, Are, are these all the sons you have? And Jesse answered almost apolog apologetically, There is still the youngest, but he's out tending the sheep. Samuel told Jesse to call for him. And when young David arrived, the writer of 1 Samuel says, He was ruddy, with a fine appearance and handsome features. So perhaps ruddiness ran in the family since both David and his son Solomon are described this way. The redness in his complexion may have come from his exposure to the sun and the color of his blood that tinged his flesh. In this mixture of red and white in her description, the bride seemed to be painting a picture of the fullness of life, health, and beauty, and without anything that would take away from his magnificent appearance. He is also, she says, the chiefest among 10,000. Militarily, it would mean a leader of 10,000 warriors. Here, the bride compares his beauty with an extremely great innumerable multitude of others and names him the most distinguished and best of them all. No one matches him in the awe-inspiring excellence of his outward appearance. Now that she has given us a general description of what he looks like and how he compares with others, the bride begins a detailed head-to-toe sketch of why he is the best-looking guy in the world. First, his head is purest gold, and his hair is wavy and black. He carries his head high as a man of noble character would, not haughtily, but gratefully aware of the responsibilities that have been entrusted to him. We find the word that's translated as wavy only here in our, New, uh, in our Old Testaments, and it's similar to a word meaning to hang down loosely. One commentator suggests that from the combined radiance of his, of his fresh and blooming countenance and of his glossy black hair adorned with a golden crown, it presented to the beholder at a distance the appearance of a figure made of solid gold with a reddish luster. His eyes, so we read in verse 12, are like doves by the water streams washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His eyes rest like milk-white doves, the pupils moving in the white of the eye as if bathing in milk, sitting by streams of water, giving them the appearance of a calm quietness that conveys tranquility and serenity to those who look upon them. Mounted like jewels, they are perfectly positioned like precious stones set in a ring to reveal their brilliance, luster, and beauty. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. She likens his cheeks to what we know as raised beds in a garden to describe their rounded shape, planted with all sorts of different spices, as she speaks of the fragrances of his beard. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. The loveliness of lilies is combined with the purity associated with this beautiful flower. His red lips are full and inviting. But not only are their shape and appearance captivating, they drip liquid myrrh, that sweetest of perfumes that was produced from the resin of various flowering plants in the Eastern world. 
every word he speaks sends her heart a flutter, and she is swept away by the pleasantness of his words, his captivating tone, and the enchanting messages his words convey, like sinking sweetly into a luxurious cloud of the most beautiful fragrance. His hands are like rods of gold set with jewels. The delicately rounded fingers of his hands are like cylinders of gold, and his fingernails are like transparent pink chrysolite. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His physique is a work of art Leonardo da Vinci would envy. Some translations read, his belly. It refers to the trunk of the body, from the shoulders to the thighs. And on Solomon, it's an amazing piece of meticulously carved ivory overlaid with sapphires. One commentator suggests that the sapphire actually referred to the deep blue lapis lazuli stone, although commentators disagree about the meaning of the blue sapphires or lapis lazuli. Most understand it to refer to his network of beautiful blue veins that crisscross his chest and give a lovely tint to his body. His legs are alabaster. Some translations read marble columns set on bases of gold. The white of the alabaster reflects his, great, his greatness and purity, while the gold reflects his nobility. But now it seems we're leaving the realm of actual physical description to portray his body with the use of symbols. The one who is being praised here is not merely a shepherd, but a king. And the comparisons are so exaggerated because the beauty of the king is enhanced by his kingly dignity. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. Stepping back to admire him from head to foot with all the images in mind that she has just laid out for us, she's overwhelmed at the very thought of him. He's like Lebanon. Oh, what was so special about Lebanon? From the time of Abraham, Lebanon, or part of it, was included in the promised land, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 7. The Lebanese coast, including Phoenicia, up to and including the land of the Gebelites, was listed in the lands that Joshua and his army that crossed over the Jordan River were not able to conquer. Efforts to take the region continued through Solomon's reign, but were probably limited to the foothills of Mount Lebanon, bordering the Bekaa Valley that we read about in the news today. The Lebanon mountain range provided excellent cedar wood for building the temples, as we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 8, and Ezra chapter 3 and verse 7. As a result, Lebanon and its cedar trees were symbols of greatness in popular proverbs, folk tales, and in the imagery of the Old Testament prophets. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 23, we read that Sennacherib, one of the Assyrian kings, described his own greatness uh, the own, uh, of his conquest by boasting that he had ascended the heights of Mount Lebanon and cut down its tallest trees. In the second verse of 1 Kings chapter 7, we read that Solomon named the place, that, the palace that he had built, the palace of the forest of Lebanon. The great redwood forests of, or of America's northwest coast would carry the same imagery for us in comparison today. As a result, Lebanon was an image of something that was awe-inspiring, stately, and majestic. And so was Solomon, as described by his lovely bride. Before she leaves her description of her perfect husband, she once again recalls his lips, his mouth, is most sweet, and is altogether desirable. I think she's kind of, kind of fond of him, don't you? Then to cap it all off, with her heart swelling with unbounded pride and admiration, she says in the second part of verse 16, This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. You want to know why I think he's so much better than any other? Not only is he the best man imaginable, he's 
vine. What a beautiful picture of a committed, passionate, and celebrated relationship between a husband and a wife. She calls him, my beloved. There is certainly a deeply passionate love between them that is expressed in their intimate relations, as we read in so many places, that might even make us blush. She's deeply in love with him, even lovesick for him, as we've heard today. And the pictures they use and the, lang the things they say about each other only underscore the fervent physical attraction they feel and enjoy together. But their relationship is not one-dimensional. It's not what happens in the bedroom alone that makes the bond between them so committed and thriving. She says, this is my friend. This is the one who comforts me and completes me, who encourages me, who challenges me, who walks with me, who listens to me with his heart, who sacrifices himself for me, who trusts me, and who praises me, saying, many women have done excellently, but you surpassed them all, like we saw in Proverbs chapter 31 just a couple of weeks ago. He is the one who stays with me for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till we go to be with the Lord. What an incredible blessing to have a friend like that. And she gratefully and unashamedly celebrates their love and their friendship. The writer of the Teacher's Quarterly makes a very appropriate application of this question that the daughters of Jerusalem asked and the bride answers. Here's what he said. The question raised by the young women of Jerusalem deserves to be taken seriously by believers today. What makes a wife certain that her husband is better than another? By the same token, what prompts a husband to believe, believe that his wife rises above any other woman? The answer to such questions can only be found in the bedrock commitments a husband and a wife make to each other in marriage. Those commitments serve as the foundation of the couple's relationship. Accordingly, the strength of the marriage depends on the willingness of the couple to invest in those commitments for the rest of their lives. For that reason, the vows repeated on the wedding day serve as much more than mere ceremonial statements that have little more than sentimental value. They testify that the couple will make investments in their marriage as long as they live. The central commitment in marriage for Christian couples involves a mutual devotion to the Lord. Their joint loyalty to Him matters most of all. If they intend to grow in love for each other, they're wise to focus on growing in God's love for them and expressing it in their relationship with one another. Otherwise, their love for one another becomes little more than an emotional response to one another. That kind of love always runs the risk of diminishing over time and perhaps even disappearing altogether. On the other hand, those couples who build each other up, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven them, listen to each other's hearts and not just their words, communicate their expectations, fears, hopes, dreams, and hurts, and all the history behind them to seek and hear more than to be heard and remember and act like they are, as Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, heirs together of God's gracious gift of life so that nothing hinders their prayers. They are the ones who celebrate the fact that their beloved is better than all others. But I know there's a question that you're still asking as we've reviewed the, the bride's description of her husband. What does this detailed description of Solomon's physical form mean? Well, it's a great question, and one that people have been asking for 3,000 years now. Certainly, if we could better understand the language and culture of Solomon's day as his first readers understood it, it would be much clearer to us. But we're separated from the Song of Solomon by some 3,000 years. Susan has wisely said that for us today, it's like being on the outside of an inside joke. So what does it mean? I believe, and the writers of our quarterlies believe, that, that this is how Solomon's Shulamite wife 
saw her husband. And in Solomon's celebration of marriage, he wrote this poem about their intense and pure love for one another. But there are others who think differently. We mentioned last week that there have been basically three methods of interpretation that have been applied to this book. The allegorical, the dramatic, and the literal. We said the allegorical lens of looking at the Song of Solomon says that the true meaning of the story or text is hidden and deeper than the words suggest on the surface. For example, John Bunyan's famous book that I hope you've read and is, a cur is currently available as a movie, Pilgrim's Progress, is an allegory. The Bible also contains genuine allegories. For example, Jesus' story of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 9, is an allegory, and Jesus explains the meaning of it in verses 18 through 23. The allegories found in the Bible were easily understood by the people of the day in which they were spoken or written. They didn't need someone to provide elaborate, mysterious explanations because they were readily understood. Still, there are passages where the biblical writer uses allegory to speak of God's love for Israel and for believers. In several places in the Old Testament, we can find images of the marriage union between God and his people. And the most frequent picture of rejecting God's plan is a sin of adultery. The book of Hosea is a primary example of this. In the New Testament, Although we don't find any reference to the Song of Solomon, John the Baptist describes the coming Messiah as the bridegroom in John chapter 3 and verse 20. And Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom in Mark chapter 2 and verse 19. Paul writes that the union of a husband and wife is an earthly picture of the union of Christ and his church in Ephesians chapter 5. And we can't forget that the marriage of the Lamb is a prominent feature in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 9. But again, there's no mention of or quotation from the Song of Solomon in all of the New Testament. There are two problems with interpreting the Bible allegorically where it's not, in, where it's not intended to be understood that way. First, it denies the authority of Scripture by making the words and ideas say something that God never intended them to say. Second, there are no guiding principles on the use of allegory. You can make things out to be whatever you want them to be. Unfortunately, we've all probably heard a sermon that took a passage of Scripture and explained it in, a, in ways God never intended it. For example, I once heard a sermon on the story in Luke chapter 5 of the paralytic who was lowered through the roof of a home where Jesus was teaching. The speaker explained that the four corners of the mat he lay on represented four ships, worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. Now, there's nothing in the text that would suggest this, and the speaker really misrepresented Scripture to support whatever point he had in mind. When we come to a book like the Song of Solomon, where the ideas and images aren't so easy to understand, especially for us in the 21st century, it's very tempting to look for hidden meanings. And so Bible students and others not particularly interested in the truth of Scripture have sought to reveal what they believe to be the hidden mysteries of the text. For example, Origen, a very early Christian scholar who died in the year 254, wrote a ten-volume commentary on the Song of Solomon. He figured that if the Bible is inspired by God, which he believed it was, then it cannot be irrelevant, unworthy of God, or indecent. If we think a passage is unbecoming to the holiness of God, then there must be a deeper meaning that we have to discover. Since several passages in the Song of Solomon provide intimate descriptions of what we would call an adult nature, there must be a hidden meaning underneath the literal text. Very briefly, this is how the allegorical interpreters understood part of the Song of Solomon, which is, in their minds, a portrayal of Christ and his church. In the first chapter, the church desires kisses from Christ, and these kisses symbolize peace and scripture that comes from his mouth. 
As for the dark skin of the bride that we read about in the fifth verse, this is the blackness of the church, which is her beauty, even though she is still sinful. The church wants to be spiritually fed by Christ and not led astray by the false teachers of verse 7. Christ instructs individual believers to go to church, to be taught by faithful ministers who are represented symbolically by the shepherds. In verse 12, we read about the king at his table, and this signifies believers sitting with the Lord at his table when we commune with him, and especially during the Lord's Supper. When we read of the king speaking of the beauty of his bride's eyes, this means the church has eyes like a dove's. And as she looks to Christ, she will be led by the Holy Spirit. The beams of the house made of cedar that we read about in verse 17 of the first chapter represent the stability of God's church on earth. Now, many of these things could well be edifying and perhaps even true, but we don't learn them from these verses of Scripture. Ideas and images have been added in from human imagination to create this link between the Song of Solomon and his bride and Christ and the church. Origen's writings were so influential that for the next 1,000 years, Christian interpreters wrote more books on the Song of Solomon than on any other individual book of the Old Testament. One writer said that the great monk of the Middle Ages, Bernard of Clairvaux, threw himself into his analysis of the Song of Solomon with all the passion and rapture of his enthusiastic soul, and in the course of 86 homilies, we would call them sermons, 86 homilies only reached the beginning of the third chapter. In this to him, an exhaustible mine of spiritual wealth before his death in 1153. Martin Luther, the great reformer, the reformer of the church in the 16th century, complained of the many wild and monstrous interpretations of the Song of Solomon. And it was only until about 200 years ago that Christian scholars began to move away from an allegorical interpretation of the Song of Solomon. Still, there are those today who would see this book not as a love story between Solomon and his Shulamite bride, but between Christ and his church. While there's no real biblical foundation to believe that the Song of Solomon is an allegory with secret hidden meanings, there are several real-life applications that are suggested by the story before us. The thing to remember about one difference that, uh, is the allegory says this is what it really means, while the application says perhaps we could apply the ideas suggested by the story in the text to our lives in this way. So your quarterly provides several such applications that are worth noting. First, in verse 8, where the bride tells her friends that she is lovesick for her husband, your quarterly reminds us that godly marriages should be characterized by mutual, moral, and emotional support. Verbally expressing love for one's spouse is vital to healthy relationships. Telling other people how wonderful one's spouse is helps too. Every spouse is encouraged when he or she hears her husband or his wife praising him or her in public. When you speak well of your spouse in, in front of your children or your friends or others, he or she often experiences a confirmation of your commitment to the relationship. On the other hand, when you speak ill of or demean your spouse, it has the opposite effect of destroying trust and security. We all like to be affirmed, not for pride's sake, but for the assurance it provides. And who better to provide that assurance than your spouse? In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter instructs husbands to respect their wives. And one way of respecting them is to honor them before others. Solomon and his bride both did that for each other in such a great way. And their example is a model for us. Another application of this passage that the writer of the Teacher's Quarterly mentions is that couples should be on guard against anything that might come between them. The bride's dream, or nightmare, was probably prompted by her sense of physical or emotional separation from her husband. The author of the Quarterly writes, The painful cry of the woman sheds light on the need for couples to work at their marriage relationship by being present for each other. Marriages 
can get into trouble when spouses are distant from each other emotionally, even though they're present physically. Being intentional about being there for each other makes a marriage stronger. All too often in marriage, one or both members of the couple become so consumed with job, success, wealth, leisure activities, video games, children, or any number of other things at the expense of the other and the relationship. As this separation continues, it usually only gets worse until one day, one of them wakes up to a stranger they don't like anymore. Husbands and wives who are truly committed to one another recognize this danger as illustrated by the separation and the dream that the bride has in our text for today. And they do whatever it takes to reaffirm their loyalty and devotion to one another and to their relationship. So as we apply the lesson from our scripture today, we can understand the importance God places on faithfulness and holiness in every marriage relationship. And in spite of, or maybe because of, the intimate language of the Song of Solomon, it certainly deserves our further study. One commentator from a couple hundred years ago writes, We need not shrink from reading about the joys of marital love in the pages of our Bibles. Our Lord teaches us that next to the duty of love to God comes out of love to one's neighbor. But a man's nearest neighbor is his wife. Therefore, after his God, his wife has the first claim upon him. But the whole conception of matrimonial duty rests on the idea of constancy in the love of man and woman. Can it be denied that the same lesson is needed in our own day? The remedy for the awful licentiousness of large portions of society can only be found in the cultivation of such lofty ideas on the relation of the sexes. It is neither necessary nor right nor possible to contradict nature. What has to be shown is that man's true nature is not like that of the animals. We cannot crush the strongest passion of human nature in our own strength. The moral of the Song of Solomon is that there is no occasion to attempt to crush it, because the right thing is to elevate it by lofty ideals of love and constancy as God has designed in the marriage relationship. This subject, he goes on to say, also deserves attention on its positive side. The literature of the ages is a testimony to the fact that nothing in the world is so interesting as love. What is so old is love and what is so fresh? At least 99 novels out of 100, he says, have a love story for their plot. This is the poetry of the most commonplace existence. Life may be hard and is drudgery a grinding yoke, but with love, all tasks are sweet. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. That experience of the patriarch is typical of the magic power of true love in every age, in every place. To the lover, it is always the time of the singing of birds. Who shall tell the value of the blessing that God has given so freely to mankind to sweeten the lot of the laborer and shed music into his heart? But this blessing must be jealously guarded and sheltered from abuse, or its honey will be turned into gall. It is for the toiler, the shepherd, whose locks are wet with the dew that has fallen upon him while guarding his flock by night, the maiden who has been working in the vineyard. It's beyond the reach of the pleasure-seeking monarch and the slothful ladies of his court. This blessing is for the pure in heart. It is utterly denied to the carnal and immoral. Finally, he says, it is reserved for the loyal and true as the peculiar reward of constancy in marriage. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. Thank you for being a part of our brief peek into this beautiful poem of Solomon and the book of Proverbs throughout this quarter of Sunday School. Next week, we turn to the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah and his message of God's redeeming hope for his people and for all of humanity. If you'd like a copy of the quarterly, you can contact your Sunday school teacher or come by or call the church office to pick a copy up.
May God bless you on your as you feast on His Word today and throughout the week to come. As you grow in knowledge through the study of God's Word, I pray that you would also grow in wisdom as you seek to apply to your life and your marriage, trusting in the Lord with all your heart and seeking opportunities to reflect God's light in a dark world, beginning first at home. In the meantime, as we're still being reminded, keep calm and wash your hands. God bless you.